Man, praise God, praise God. Praise God. That's right. set up here. All right, come on, let's start off. Let's give Jesus the highest praise in the house of the Lord today. Come on, he is good. Man, I tell you what, it is good to be here. Lifeline Church, first Wednesday, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, like Elliot said, my name is Joshua. I've been coming to this church about three years, and um, it's been an amazing three years. It really has. It's been an amazing journey that I've been on that God has, uh, that God has brought me through. And uh, I just, I, I want to give Lifeline Church, I want to give y'all, not the building, but you, you people, I want to give you guys some honor. And just everything that you guys are doing is just so amazing. And, uh, you know, from the moment that I came in, I was so welcomed. I, it was so warm, and you guys just brought me right into the family, and I felt like this is my home ever since then. So come on, Lifeline Church, give it up for yourself. Come on. An amazing, amazing house of the Lord here. All right, all right. Well, yeah, so I've been coming to this church for about three years, and uh, I've been the youth group leader for about a year and a half. And I know what you guys are thinking. You're like, you don't look like you lead youth group. You look like you are in the youth group. Yeah, I get it. I get it. You know, I'm, you know, I'm 23 years old. I look like I'm 15. It's okay. I get it. You know what? I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you. So, uh, someone actually said this. Someone said, I'm like the student body president of the youth group. That's like the equivalent of what I am, which is pretty accurate, which is pretty accurate. <laughs> A little more backstory before we get started here. Uh, I've been married for about two years now, coming up on two years to my beautiful wife, Annalie. I don't know where she is. She's over there. She's right there. There's where. And uh, about 10 months ago, I became a father to my wonderful son, Desmond. He's also over there. He deserves, he deserves a shout. He deserves a shout. Well, to get started, I just want to just wanna mention, guys, I, I, I grew up in an amazing family. I had... I, and I, I wrote this down, and, I, and I, I say this with all seriousness, that God really aligned the stars for my upbringing to be a, a godly Christian young man. He really did. I grew up, was born into a godly Christian family, going to a godly Christian church. And I had, I had parents, I had grandparents, I had pastors, I had mentors, I had leaders, I had teachers all throughout my life that were constantly pouring into me. They were constantly building me up and filling my cup so that I can fulfill my purpose of being a godly Christian young man. And, uh, well, as some, as some of you know, that doesn't always happen, right? <laughs> well, one thing that I've learned since becoming a father is, you know, it makes you, it makes you realize and it makes you think about how you treated your parents. Some of you parents can relate, I bet. When you have a, a son or a daughter, it makes you think about, how, how did I treat them in this circumstance? My son's only 10 months old, but I already see some of my own rebellion at times growing up in him, and uh, it, 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 it makes me shudder a little bit, just being completely vulnerable with you guys. Because despite my parents and everyone in my life, despite their best efforts, despite all the hard work that they put in to me, I threw it all away. And I'm being completely serious. You see, it could be really hard, you know, being a teenager. And I can, I, I, I see some of my youth here in the audience, and you guys know what it's like, and everyone knows what it's like being in high school. There they are right there. I told them if they didn't show up, they don't get food next week, so. <laughs> Somebody's not getting cookies. But growing up in high school, you know, you, you, you grow up with this image, right? And you grow up with, with, you know, all the work that your parents and everyone has put into you. And I had, I had what I call, I call it quotation mark faith, because that was my faith, was air quotes, right? And so as soon as I got to high school, and as soon as I started to experience some real problems, as soon as I started to experience some, some real struggles of, of identity and self-esteem and, 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 and loneliness and especially sin, I found myself pulling farther away from God. And I call it, now looking back on it, I call it the sin cycle. And that's really what it was, is it was a cycle. Is that I would do something that, that I knew was wrong, that my parents had taught me was wrong. They told me it was wrong, and I said, no, I don't want to listen to you. I want to do it my own way. And then that shame would come in, that condemnation, the voice of the enemy, right? The lies that he's going to speak into your life, right? That comes in. 
and you start to doubt and you start to wonder, does God really love me? Can he ever forgive me for what I just did? And in that moment, what I decided to do as a stupid teenager (laughs) was I pulled away from God. And in those moments, in the quiet places of my teenage years, when I was struggling the most with my sin, with my shame, I decided I wanted to push God away. And then the cycle continues. And some of you guys know what I'm talking about. The farther you push God away, the farther his light is from your heart. And it's hard to live in that light, producing good fruit when you're far away from God. And so then the cycle just continues And then you start to see the bad fruit start showing up in your life. The depression, right? The loneliness, the self-esteem issues, right? The lustful thoughts, these things just creep in. And then the cycle continues and it continues and it continues. And I I realized at this point I was trapped. I was enslaved. I couldn't get out of this cycle over and over and over again. For years, I struggled. I, I had no way out. And the word does mention this a little bit, and I want to I want to bring up some scripture for you just now. Jesus in this in this passage, he's addressing some Jewish people. This is from the Sermon on the Mount, and he starts off by talking. He's he's addressing a problem of false prophets in this in this next scripture. But what I want us to do is we're we're going to take a little bit of a different point of view at it. So uh, go ahead and put that up on the screen. It's from Matthew chapter seven. It's from the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. This is a key right here. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And look at this right here. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And so what Jesus is saying here is when you look at someone who's trying to teach you, right, is look at their life. Look at the fruit that's coming out of their life and make a decision. Is it good fruit that's coming out of their life? Is it charity? Is it kindness? Is it good words? Or is it bad fruit? Is it anger? Is it jealousy? And you will recognize whether they are a good tree or a bad tree by their fruit. But what I want us to do, and just take a moment, is I want us to turn this this point of view and just flip it around. And I want us to look inwardly. And I want you to think about the fruit that you're producing right now in your life. You don't have to say anything out loud, don't. But just think about the fruit that you are producing. Is it good fruit? Or is it bad fruit? Now, it's not always 100% for sure. It's not either black or white. But a lot of times, the fruit that we're producing can tell us where we're at in our lives. It can tell us whether we are a good tree or a bad tree. And when, when I look back on all of the experiences that I had of the sin cycle, of, of, of the, the lustful thoughts that had just intruded my everyday existence right? The depression, the loneliness, that's all bad fruit. And if, if, if I had just read this scripture, if I had just had the eyes to see and the ears to hear what Jesus was saying, I would have been able to recognize, I'm, this is all bad fruit, guys. Yeah. Amen. All of these things that I'm experiencing, this is bad fruit. Well, what does that tell me about me? Well, then I'm, I'm a sick tree. I am a sick petrified, diseased tree, and I'm producing bad fruit, and I don't want to anymore. What was I producing? Depression, loneliness, idolatry, isolation, rebellion was the biggest one. It was rebellion. But here's the thing. God doesn't create bad trees. Amen? Amen? He doesn't create bad trees, but good trees can become sick. Good trees can become diseased. And what kind of fruit does a sick tree produce? Am I right? I didn't start out a bad tree, guys. Like I said, and I, I, I'm not just blowing hot air up here. Literally, I could not have imagined a better upbringing for myself to grow up in the ways of the Lord. 
but the enemy got in my mind, and for the life of me, I couldn't get him out. And I was stuck in that sin cycle over and over and over again. And some of you, I know, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you are struggling with that same sickness, the sickness of sin. In fact, I wasn't even struggling. I was, I was suffocating, right? I felt like I was crushed by the weight of my sin. The enemy and his lies had taken hold of me and they had pushed me so far away from God that I didn't think there was any coming back. And that, that loss of knowing that God was there turned to anger and turned to even more rebellion and the cycle continued. Okay, so that's it. That, let's pray, guys. Let's pray. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, no. No, thank God the story doesn't end there. Am I right? No, yeah. The story doesn't end there. The story doesn't end there. It gets good. Spoiler alert. It gets good. But no, the, 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 the story doesn't end there because God had a plan. Amen? God had a plan. And his plan was of restoration. His plan was healing. His plan was to take me out of the sin cycle to break the chains, to break the bondage, right? You see, despite the fact that we are sick, despite the fact that we are sinners, God has a plan. And God's plan is of healing, of restoration, right? God takes the broken things and he makes them whole. Amen? I want to look at another passage from Matthew. This is just a couple chapters later. And in the, the context of this is Jesus is hanging out with a bunch of sinners, Right? And the Pharisees are, are looking on him and they're judging him. Like, why is, this, why is this teacher hanging out with these people? So this is from Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, verse 12 through 13. Jesus speaking, he says, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. That's you and me, guys. That's you. I hate to tell you, that's you and me, bro. That's us. This is what God says, okay? No matter how you f- far you've fallen, I will always be there to pick you back up. No matter how many times you've failed, right? No matter what, doesn't matter what you've done. When you've done the worst things imaginable, I am willing and able to brush the dust off of you and say, tomorrow's a new day. Let's try again. Is that good news to anyone? Come on. And this is what God was trying to show me. He was trying so hard to get this message through to me at my worst moments. The thing I struggled most was shame. I didn't think God could forgive me. I didn't think God could restore me or heal me or bring the broken things back together. I thought I had simply done too much, that there was no way that God could take me back. You see, you see what I'm talking about when the enemy and his lies come in. And they pull you farther and farther away where you think there's no way of rescuing. But this is what God says to that. He says, my grace is greater than all of your regrets. Look at that word, greater, greater, bigger, stronger, more powerful. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how far you are from him because his grace is greater. Amen. And I want to share with you guys one more verse. Just one more verse. I want to share with you my life verse. This is a verse that, it's been so impactful for me. I've never, I found it shortly after being saved. And uh, it's just made such an important, it's made a big impact on me. I don't know, I want to get emotional. But this is a verse that I hold very close to my heart. Okay, literally, because I have a necklace on that's got it etched into it. Literally, close to my heart. So go ahead and put it up on the screen. This is Ephesians chapter 2. This is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. He says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. What amazes me the most is God's heart behind this. When I read this verse, I can see God's heart in everything that he's done. The reason for everything he's done is because of this. His great love. I want you all to say that with me. Great love. His great love. He loved us so much that he gave everything for us. Amen? He was willing to go to 
any lengths to get us back. And that's exactly what he was doing for me. He went the farthest lengths to bring me back into his family. He reached out in every way imaginable. He would speak to me in dreams and visions. I, I never told anyone this, but he, would, he was speaking to me. And every time I would ignore him. He even went so far to bring a godly woman into my life. She's gone now. She left. She, didn't, she, she told me not to point to her. <laughs> Because maybe, just maybe, I would listen to this woman more than I would listen to my parents. <laughs> Classic. He was with me in the quiet places. He was reaching out to me. And he, even, even when I was so far from him, he was there. And this is, this is what I want you to know about him. If there's one thing I want you to take away from everything that I'm going to say here tonight, it's this right here. God hasn't given up on you, so don't give up on him. He will never stop pursuing your heart. He will never stop reaching out. He will do it again and again. He wants your love. He will call your name over and over trying to get you back. That's how much he loves you. His efforts to bring his lost children home are relentless never ceasing. That's how he won me over. Amen. Relentless efforts, never giving up, never stopping. That's exactly what happened. You see, Annalie and her church, sorry, Annalie and her family uh, went to a church at this time. This is, uh, this is a couple years ago. Annalie and her church, uh, <laughs> said it again. Annalie and her family went to a church, a, a, a godly church, and um, this is towards the beginning of us dating, and uh, this, is, this is how insolent I was to God, right? This is how rebellious I was. They invited me to church, and instead of taking this as a sign of God trying to reach out to me, God trying to, to pull me back, I thought, man, this is a really good opportunity to impress them. <laughs> Y'all are laughing. That wasn't supposed to be a joke. I'm, I'm serious. That's how bad it was. That's how bad it was. That's how much rebellion and anger I had in my heart towards God. That they would invite me to church and I would go just to make them think I was better than I actually was. Yeah. But more importantly, because there's a bright side, that's exactly where God wanted me to be. It's exactly where he wanted me to be in that moment. So I went to church with him. This was just the first. This was just the first part. His plans were in motion. And it wasn't until like a year and a half later that it finally paid off. And this, is, this is what happened. It was, it was Saturday morning. It was the summer of 2021. I remember. It was pretty recent. And I just woke up and I just, God was calling me to just open my computer and open up YouTube. And right there at the top of my, my little YouTube recommendations, was of all things an old Billy Graham sermon from like 1966. Like, okay, I don't know why YouTube would recommend that to me. I have never heard or listened to anything from Billy Graham. I wasn't listening or watching anything that was remotely Christian at that time. I, I, if, let me revise that. I do know why that was recommended. I do. I do. So I watched it. And I'm listening, and again, this is like 50 years in the making. This is 1966, he recorded it at some crusade down in LA. And guys, by the end of it, it just, it, it cut me down. All the walls, all the barriers, all the distance between God and myself, just cut him right down. And I, I mean, I'm not like the super most tough guy, you know? But I rarely cry, I'm just being honest, I rarely cry, I'm being vulnerable here, but I rarely cry, guys. Have you ever had one of those ugly cries? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Where like, you're, the, the, the faith, fluids just leaking out. It's, it, it wasn't pretty. Just spare you the, the intricate details. It was not pretty, okay? And I'm listening to him preach and I'm hearing him speak about the gospel. And it's like, it's the first time I'm ever hearing it. 50 years in the making, guys. 
And in that moment, all those years ago, Billy Graham says to the people he was speaking to, he says, if anyone here tonight is not sure about your relationship with Jesus, you don't know where you're going to go when you die. You need to handle that right now. He said to these people, he said, don't leave here tonight before you handle your relationship with Jesus. Don't wait till you get home. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till next Sunday, right now. And that was God speaking to me. And so there on Saturday morning, sunlight filling the room, I got on my knees in front of my computer (laughs) and I just cried out to him. I just, I, I, I gave him everything that I had. I just laid it all down, all my fear, all of my shame, all of my regrets, everything. I just, God, just take it away. Just take it away. I know you can do it. Just take it away and bring me back. And bring me back. And that's exactly what he did. That's exactly what he did. God rescued me. He restored me. He healed me. And he brought me here tonight to Lifeline Church to tell you all about it. As he brought me here tonight to tell my story because in the middle of my mess, he was writing a message. In the middle of my test, he was giving me a testimony to share with you. He's brought me here tonight so that someone here in this room can hear this word of encouragement and be changed. Brought me here tonight to tell you that God is not only on your side, but he is fighting for you, not against you. He is pulling for you, hoping, wishing that you would just submit yourself and surrender to him tonight. Just like I did three years ago. So if that is you tonight, you're desperate and and you need God to rescue you, to save you, and maybe even just to sanctify you. Tell you what, God has a plan for you. He has some things that he's been calling you to do. He has some things that he wants you to do, some changes he wants you to make. What I think God is saying in my story is this, doesn't matter how much you rebel against him. Doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how ashamed you are and how guilty of sin you are. It doesn't matter because his grace is greater. His grace is greater than your shame. His grace is greater than your sin. His grace is greater than all of your regrets. He is greater. Again, if there's one thing that you can take away from tonight's message, it's this right here. God hasn't given up on you. So don't give up on him. As soon as you lean in, as soon as you lean in to his call, That's the moment he's going to begin to change your life. Not will. That's a promise. That's a promise, not from me, but from God. All you have to do, all he's asking you to do is lean in and allow him to work. Just lean in. If you allow him, he can remove the guilt of sin from you as far as the east is from the west, it says in scripture. If you allow him, he can remove those chains, the bondage of sin. If you allow him, he can give you the thoughts and desires that align with his will. If you allow him, he will give you a new spirit, a new spirit, a new heart. Like David said in Psalm 51, He said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. If you allow him, he can do that. If you allow him. That's exactly what he did in my life. The moment that I sat there in my bedroom, all alone, just me and him, he started to change things. He started to make a way. He said, I'm gonna get you out of the cycle. I'm going to break the chains. I'm going to get you out. I'm going to rescue you because I have a plan for you, son. That's what he said to me. He said, I have a plan for you. You don't know it yet, but you have a gifting. You have a calling and you have a purpose greater than yourself. So all that sin, all that shame, 
everything, you can leave that behind. Because now it's about you and me. It's about you and me. By leaning into him and his call, the very same sins that I was enslaved by in this cycle for all those years were a thing of the past. He loosed the chains off of me. And I heard this just recently in, in my Bible college. We we're talking about Exodus. We we're talking about Moses and God delivering the people out of slavery, out of Egypt. And one of, one of the professors said this, He said, God can take you out of Egypt and he can also take the Egypt out of you. He can take you out of the sin cycle and he can take the sin cycle out of you so that it never happens again. So that you can live in freedom and in victory because he can, because he's able. By leaning in, he cleansed my heart and spirit like David. He gave me a heart that delights in him, delights in his law, in his presence. By leaning in, he called me to a higher purpose. And he revealed the path that he has for me. He revealed that he's given me a gifting, that he's given me a story to share. And that he placed me here tonight speaking to all of you because I leaned in. Because in that moment, I humbled myself and I said, Lord God, I give you everything. Everything that I am, it's all yours. So here's what we're gonna do tonight. If any of that spoke to you, if that's you tonight, what I want you to do is very simple, is lean in. Lean into whatever it is that he's calling you to do. Lean into what he's trying to do in your life. Lean in to the things that he's trying to remove from your life. There's some things that he wants to pull out. Some areas maybe that you've been struggling. He wants to work on that tonight. And by leaning in and allowing him to work, he can cleanse that. He could pull that out. Lean in tonight. Lean in to his desire to bring you into his kingdom, into his family, and to bring you closer to him.